are free. We'll drive our logs to Glens Falls and we'll haste our girls to see. With plenty to drink and plenty to eat, back to the world we'll go. And we'll raise the wild woods over and want more a lumbering gold. The lumbering industry uh, was the big business for the Adirondacks at that time. The actual peak of uh, the Hudson River drives uh, which included many areas besides the Hudson River Gorge, was uh, 1872. There were 21 different companies that were uh, running logs uh, down the Hudson in the springtime. The Industrial Revolution fueled an expanding economy. Manufacturers looked for raw materials, and the progressive spirit of the times demanded that the land be productive. Timber resources seemed inexhaustible then. It was a time characterized by the most careless exploitation. The uh, complete Adirondacks was either cut pretty much uh, by timbering operations or was burned during the various fires that happened in the very early 1900s. Well, you see, there was no restriction. You could do what you wanted with the land that you owned. And the Catskills by the 1870s had large areas which had been devastated by the efforts of tanners and lumbermen. But the result was that the forests were vanishing and forest fires were becoming very, very common, burning up the debris of, of the tree cutting. And the um, um, trout were disappearing from the streams, deer were disappearing, and um, other game, all sorts of wildlife was gone. A uh, photographer named Stoddard uh, has several photos showing the destruction that uh, the loggers uh, reaped on the forest in the middle decades of the century. Of course, when the trees are cut, the, uh, the water table goes down and uh, the area becomes less uh, suitable as a watershed. The turning point came when scientists discovered there is a price to pay for charred stumps and rocky slopes stripped of vegetation. Certainly the biggest single uh, influence was probably the publication in the spring of 1864 of a book called Man and Nature. It was written by George Perkins Marsh. He became fascinated with, with what had happened worldwide in, uh, with forest destruction, uh, the creation of deserts and things of this sort. And the Marsh recommended that uh, uh, people take account of these kinds of phenomena and do something about it. Uh, the people who were arguing for the Forest Reserve Law of 1885 uh, were not interested in wilderness and recreation. I think that the fact that it might be there for recreation, they considered a benefit, it's a good idea, sure, people should go out there and camp and hunt, and we're glad to have them do that. But the main reason is to protect the watershed. And so it was organized, uh, or individual people, individual camp owners who started coming to the Adirondacks and buying property in the 1870s. Uh, and also organizations such as the Brooklyn Constitution Club, and the New York City Board of Trade and Transportation, of all things. Why the New York City Board of Trade and Transportation? Well, the canal system in New York State was still terribly, terribly important in the 1870s and 1880s. Uh, you make a mess of the water supply, and you start getting flooding situation or irregular d uh, discharges of waters from the mountain a mountainous areas in the summertime. Your, your canal systems have to get uh, rudely, uh, rather badly battered, and that's going to affect commerce. The call for action grew more insistent. The press rallied public support to save the forests. While scenic beauty and recreation took a back seat to more practical concerns, a growing number of people came to agree with the sentiment expressed by journalist C.H. Hammond. He was floating on the, in a boat on the Racket River at the time. Had I my way, he said, I would mark out a circle of a hundred miles in diameter and throw around it the protecting aegis of the Constitution. I would make it a forest forever. There is room enough for civilization in regions better fitted for it. It has no business among these mountains, these rivers and lakes, these gigantic boulders, these tangled valleys and dark mountain gorges. I would consecrate these to the vagabond spirit and make them a place wherein a man could turn savage and rest for a fortnight or a month from the toils and cares of life. Constitution forever. Uh, the recreational uh, regeneration of the human spirit, if you will, the, by getting away from the toils and cares of life. Uh, very prophetic. On May 15, 1885, a wasted land became a treasure. New York's legislature voted to protect the threatened wilderness. 
setting aside lands in the Adirondacks and Catskills to be forever kept as wild forest lands. With constitutional enshrinement in 1894, the forever wild provision became one of the most significant pieces of environmental legislation in the United States. New Yorkers gave themselves a sanctuary where trees are allowed to grow old, where nature is preserved, and where people are refreshed. I think that the fact that New York State was actively pursuing conservation measures uh, in the 1870s and 1880s is an indication of the progressive attitudes of the people of this state. I think that a lot of other states were encountering the same sorts of fears about deterioration of the landscape and were unable to make any statutory moves towards saving what they had. While timber cutting is not allowed on forest preserve lands, with nearly four million acres of privately owned land in the parks, the forest products industry still has room to prosper. Concern, however, is not solely with today's profits, but with a healthy, growing environment for the future. Probably one of the most important things that our society's done has been to begin to understand, though I, I don't think we yet understand completely, that we've got just one world, and we have just the resources we have, and that we need to treat them um, with a lot of care and respect. What we found out, of course, at the turn of the century was that forests can be managed, that they're not there just to be used once, but that with care and with some scientific uh, principles used, forests can be renewed uh, indefinitely, virtually forever. And the industry um, learned those lessons, learned them the hard way, along with the rest of the country. Um, and we, we now understand how to manage forests, and we don't have to go through that sort of thing that we went through before. We're a, a whole lot smarter, and we know what we're doing now um, with the woods. We know that there aren't new places to go. There simply is, there are no new lands. Facing increasing demands on the land that we have, and the challenge of accommodating human needs, the question reoccurs. What is the value of wilderness? A stand of virgin timber on the forest preserve is a reminder that nature has a purpose beyond its material value. Some wildlife require old growth forests in order to have their optimum opportunity for, for living. This dead pine that we're looking at right now would make a nice home for the osprey or perhaps an eagle, golden or bald eagle. You know, people will say, you, you should cut those trees down because they're mature and therefore we're wasting them if they fall on the ground. And yet, the, the wilderness areas have the very best system of recycling that you can see anywhere because nothing is wasted, absolutely nothing. It all goes back into the soil and is then taken up again to, to form more nutrients for the plants and the trees that grow on it. So you, you just don't have any waste in, in these wilderness areas. Even though you see the big trees mature and uh, fall over and die, they just simply make more material for others coming on. Nature has a way of providing a whole variety of things, and, and that's why when uh, man first came to this area, it was a, actually an Eden of, of wildlife and uh, vegetation and so on. We come in, we try to change it all, and I think it's a great mistake to try to change all of it. After the Civil War, I think some very important things happened in the culture to, to add to uh, the views of, of wilderness and of nature that begin in Romanticism. Uh, these had to do with discoveries about the way nature works, uh, the, uh, the discovery that nature is a system, uh, that nature works in a sense, in a process, and that when man interferes with this process, sometimes nature can go wrong. Uh, nature no longer can do things for people, like serve ag agricultural needs. In terms of wilderness, this has important implications in that some people started to think, well, if nature works so perfectly, when left alone, why don't we take some of it and leave it alone? Let's, let's take some nature and leave it alone and admire it just for the perfection that it does present. Now, it takes a long time for this to sink into the culture, and it's well into the 20th century before this kind of a view becomes important in terms of the Adirondacks. I think by the 1920s, uh, in other words, long after the Forever Wild Clause was written into the Forest Reserve Law of 1885 and then into the 1894 Constitution, well after that, the culture itself discovers that wilderness is something important. And it's, it's, it's important because it is a place where you feel better when you go to it. Uh, it makes you physically stronger, it makes you 
think deep thoughts. Uh, and it, and it, uh, that, a traditional function of wilderness is uh, it, it inspires contemplation and meditation. Uh, but added on to this, and this is the thing that I think is really important, is a discovery that nature itself is something worth saving, something that, that, something that works in a beautiful, harmonious, and dynamic way. Adirondack Park, that sounds simple, a big area, six million acres, practically the size of the state of Vermont, uh, bigger than Yellowstone, isn't that wonderful? But the simple fact of the matter is it's a co very complex area. Yes, 38, 40 percent of it is owned by the state of New York, is, is a part of the of the, uh, uh, is, uh, constitutes a large part of the Forest Preserve of New York State. But there's also a considerable amount of private land in a variety, devoted to a variety of uses. And a resident population uh, scattered in some, oh, in more than 90 towns, villages, hamlets, uh, or whatever you will, 125,000 people who, uh, have, who try to make a living in this neck of the woods, and it ain't easy, McGee, as they say. Uh, and the, 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 the challenge, is and it all, and it has been for years. How do you make? How do all of these forces live in reasonable harmony with each other? The cry of the loon is symbolic of the forest preserve. Both are precious and fragile, yet resilient when left alone. The fate of both rests with how we balance our short-term needs with the long-term goal of preservation. How can we take advantage of this vast and beautiful region while ensuring its integrity? The Adirondack and Catskill Mountains are the crown jewels of the Empire State. Who owns the land today is not as important as its condition when passed on to future generations. Major funding for this program was provided by the State of New York and the New York State Public Television Stations, with additional funding by New York Telephone and the American Conservation Association, Incorporated, and the following contributors.